Welcome to the online edition of Forsyth Church of Christ for this week. We're really glad that you're joining us and thankful that you took some time out to, to spend some time with us. My name is John Dobbs. I'm the preaching minister for Forsyth Church of Christ. This is Daniel Kirkendall, our associate minister. Yes, and John and I are both honored that you've chosen to be here and participate in this video experience of uh, what we do and who we are at Forsyth Church of Christ. And uh, today, John's going to bring you a message and have a communion time. And uh, we hope that is a worshipful experience for you. We do want to engage with you, though, so make sure you use the comments section, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, and tell everyone hello. And then at the end of the video, um, we'll direct you to our website, which will be on the screen uh, for most of the video. And we'll have uh, um, some, some directions, maybe, or instructions to help you out there. We want to be able to bless all of you as much as we possibly can. Possibly can but right now um, again we hope you enjoy this and thank you so much for being here yes uh, we are in the second of a series called life truths from the chief of sinners and so we're going to be talking about that our text is gonna be in Acts chapter 9 uh, today but to get us get our minds set and to think about just our commitment and our relationship to the Lord we're gonna watch a brief video and then we'll be back with today's sermon Well, that's a great reminder of our initial steps in Christianity to when we express our faith in Christ and are baptized. And I hope that if you were baptized already, that that was a good reminder. And if you haven't been baptized, that you'll think about it. And, we're, and it'll, it'll come up in our text uh, again today, and we'll talk about that some. But, uh, but it's a wonderful thing that Christ cleanses us of our sins, and uh, and gives us a brand new life. Now, we're talking this uh, for a few weeks here about life truths from the chief of sinners, life lessons, things that we hear from, from, uh, from Paul who described himself as the chief of sinners. And we talked about that last week. If you didn't hear that message, uh, I encourage you to go to our YouTube page and, and watch that. You can see all of our messages there in order. And it's very easy to watch those. But last week we talked about the brutal and vicious persecution that was brought about by the man from Tarsus. And his hatred for the followers of Jesus was frightening to the believers of that day. And really, to, to read it today is even frightening and to think about how much he wanted to destroy Christianity. And, but in spite of his great familiarity with the Hebrew scriptures, uh, he failed to see Jesus as the Messiah. And so we get to Acts chapter 9. Uh, I want us to just jump right in here in verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so Paul is convinced that the destroying the followers of Jesus was the only way to serve the God of Israel. He was committed to his life long commitment to to scripture to judaism and to the god of israel and he thought that these jesus followers were a threat to everything that he held close now let's read a little further down verses three through nine it says as saul's encounter with jesus uh, i apologize i'm going to talk about that in a second but let's read verses three through nine 
Verse 3, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. And Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus, and he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. And so I think about this encounter. Saul's encounter with Jesus is an iconic turning point for him. It's something he's going to talk about uh, in, his, in his letters, and he's going to recount this story again. And, and he thought his eyes were wide open to the threat of the Jesus people, but instead now he's blinded and led into Damascus. And I think it, it's interesting to try to imagine what is on Paul's mind, what's on Saul's mind here as he's spending these days uh, blinded, unable to see, he's not eating, he's not drinking, and, and thinking about his experience. Well, during this time, God calls a disciple named Ananias and told him where to find Saul. And in verse 11 of our text, it says, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, think about that for a second. Here's, and here we've seen what's happening with Saul. And then over in another place, there's Ananias, a believer in Jesus, devout, someone who loves God. And God says, I want you to go and approach this, this terrorist, this person who has the authority to carry you off to jail, this person who hates Christians. I want you to go in there and lay hands on him so he can regain his sight. And, and Ananias registers his concern, but God tells him that, that, that Saul is a chosen instrument to carry his name before the Gentiles and kings and before the children of Israel. So let's look at verse 17 and uh, read how that encounter went. It says, Ananias went and found Saul, and he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight, and then he got up and was baptized. And afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength and stayed with the believers in Damascus a few days. As I said earlier, Saul will recount this story many times in his life, this turning point when he met Jesus and his whole life was changed. And what we learn from the chief of sinners is uh, to accept the truth about Jesus. And that's kind of our theme today is accept the truth. That's what we're learning from, from Saul and from this experience. And there's a lot about in the Bible about Jesus and truth. And I want to spend just a minute in John's gospel and, and buzz through some, some things that John said that connect Jesus and truth. And one of those things is that the message of truth is the rescue mission of Jesus. When we talk about what is truth and what is Jesus and what's that connection, the message is Jesus came to rescue us. In John 1.14 says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came to this world as a, a human being so that he could save us. It's a rescue mission. And that's the truth. And another thing about truth is in John 1.17, the source of truth is Jesus. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, the Bible says. And you know, we live in a, a time now, and due to social media and the internet, that everybody's an expert on everything. Oh, it's a Google world, right? You just have a question, just Google it and get the answer, and you think you know everything there is to know about it. Some Sometimes people uh, have their doctor's appointments with Dr. Google. They just Google up their symptoms and say, oh, I know what's wrong with me. And the problem with that is we don't always really know the basis of the information that we're getting. 
But with Jesus, we recognize he's the source of real truth, not internet experts, not what Google says, not what we just feel or think. The real truth, the truth we can count on is found in Jesus. And the result of truth is freedom from the shackles of sin and shame. Jesus said in John chapter 8 that uh, to those who believed in him, if you abide in my word and are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so we know that when we think about Jesus and the truth, we know that we're finding release from the shackles and shame of sin. And then the power of truth is that it brings us a peace and assurance. In John 14, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then in verse six, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He says, I am the truth. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe me, trust me. And so what the man from Tarsus embraced in Jesus Christ changed his life in every way. And Jesus is still changing lives today. He's changing your life. He's changing my life. The more that we yield to him, the more we learn of him, the more we we, uh, involve him in our life, he's changing our life. So how do we accept the truth about Jesus today? Well, let's listen to what to, to this story of the chief of sinners and his encounter with Jesus. And I think we're going to know some things that will help us to accept Jesus as well. And one of those things is to admit, to admit that Jesus is Lord. And going back to Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, and when that light shone down around Saul, and what, was, what came out of Saul's mouth? He fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? I think the one thing that we need to know is that we have to admit that Jesus is Lord. And this is a huge step for Saul. This is a huge admission. He's a persecutor. He's somebody who has done his best to to tear down everything that Jesus had tried to build up. And now he has three days of blindness after this encounter. And during those three days, wonder what he's thinking about. Is he thinking about the people that he persecuted? Is he thinking about the the families that he divided? Is he thinking about Stephen as he watched Stephen die as he was being stoned? The cost, uh, is he thinking about the cost of following Christ? That if I follow Christ, then everything that this reputation I have, this, this journey I'm on, this everything about my life so far, It's going to cost me all of that to take on a new path through life. So one commentator said, Saul must have been thoroughly disoriented by this encounter. It's one thing to discover you've been wrong all along about something, but it's quite another matter to discover the person you thought was a sham and a hoax actually exists, actually knows your name has been watching the violence you've been perpetrating and is putting a personal stop to it right then and right there. What does does it mean to admit that Jesus is Lord? What are we admitting? I think there's uh, three or four things I want to mention. There's probably more, but, but one thing is when I admit that Jesus is Lord, I'm recognizing that under my own power, I cannot be the person I want to be, that, that God wants me to be, that I don't have it within me. The strength is not there. The knowledge is not there. The ability is not there. I need God to be a part of my life. And when I admit that Jesus is Lord, I'm turning my life over to him because I recognize uh, I don't have that power to change my life. And I'm confessing the sin that misled me and misdirected me, that deceived me. I'm confessing sin in my life. And that because of that sin, I really need Jesus to come and be my Lord. I think when we admit that Jesus is Lord, we count the cost as we consider what changes we're willing to make. How is this going to change my life? What's this going to do to my relationships, to my friendships, to my, my moral standards, to my understanding of who I am in the Lord? And there's just so many things that when we become a Christian, it changes everything. And then to admit that Jesus is Lord is, means that we ask God to help us to make the right next steps. 
See, admitting Jesus as Lord is not just holding our hand up in an assembly or saying a prayer or, or just uh, admitting that, you know, something intellectually. It's not just saying the words. It's enacting the pathway of obedience and discipleship. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21. He said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so it's not just a matter of saying the right things. It's a matter of giving our heart to God, giving our obedience to God, of letting Jesus be Lord. So the first thing that it's going to take for me to accept the truth of Jesus in my own life is to admit it, to admit that Jesus is Lord. And the second thing is to submit in baptism to submit to what God has asked me to do, to what Christ wants me to do. The scales fell away from Saul's eyes in this text, and the next thing it says is that he was baptized. And, that, uh, and that, that's uh, in verse 18. Once Saul was, had those scales fell away from his eyes, and I don't, I don't know how to imagine that, but, but suddenly he could see after being blinded for three days, and the next step for him was to be baptized. And what did Saul see when those scales fell away from his eyes? He was face to face with one of those Jewish Christians that he hated so much that he used to take off to prison, that he used to divide from his families, a, a, a Christian like Stephen that he approved of as he was being stoned. He's face to face in the room with Ananias. And he could see the simple command of Christ and he yielded to Christ and was baptized. In telling this story later in Acts 22, he, he has, Paul says that, that Ananias said to him, What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on the name of the Lord. And later in his life, as he wrote to the Roman church, he would say that we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so I need to admit that Jesus is Lord, and I want to submit to him uh, in baptism. And then the third thing that it means as we talk about accepting the truth about Jesus is to commit to the Jesus life. It's not just a matter of saying a few words and being baptized. We're talking about changing our whole life here, and that's what we see with Saul. God had big plans for Saul, things that he didn't even know yet. If you look at verse 15, the Lord tells Ananias, Go see Saul, because Saul's my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings and to the, the people of Israel. I mean, that's quite an assignment that God has in mind. He's going to send Saul into some very powerful places. We're going to talk in a few weeks about his appearance before King Agrippa. I mean, Saul is going to make a, ma a massive difference in the world. And he also said in verse 16, I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Saul was going to suffer. And it's not going to be long in Saul's story as we continue reading that people become upset with him and he endures some persecution himself, some religious hostility. It's a true test of his commitment to Jesus. This is going to be hard. Are you willing to stick with it? Are you going to, willing to commit to the Jesus life? You know, I was thinking about Ananias a little bit, and God had big plans for Ananias. He had to commit to the Lord in spite of his fears. He had legitimate objections. Saul could arrest him. Saul could, could hurt him. Saul could do harm to him. But he, you know, he really was not somebody that Ananias could trust. But Jesus knew his heart, and Jesus trusted him. And Ananias shared the gospel with Saul. He had big, God had big plans for Ananias and for Saul. And I really believe God has big plans for every disciple. But the, the, the key to living out the plans of God in our life is a commitment to live the Jesus life. And I think that's so important. And so for persecutor Paul to experience new life, he had to accept the truth about Jesus, which means he had to admit, admit that Jesus is Lord. He had to submit himself to baptism for cleansing of sin, and he had to commit his life to the Jesus life. Well, that's asking a lot. You know, if you're a person who's not a Christian, not a follower of Jesus, this is asking a lot. It's asking for your whole life. We're not going to try to make it sound simple and easy and, and, uh, and no worries, you know. But it is about 
giving our whole life to Christ. Is it worth it? Is it worth all this effort? Well, let's ask the chief of sinners. He writes later on to the church in Philippi, and he says this, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage that I could gain Christ and become one with him. And he goes on in verse 14 to say, I press on to the, reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. And so when I ask the Apostle Paul as, as what he became, or in, in our text, Saul, uh, when I ask him, is it worth it? He says, it's worth it. It's worth everything. It's worth leaving everything behind to follow Jesus Christ. And so my question for you is, would you accept and submit and commit to Jesus Christ today? That's a, a life lesson from the chief of sinners, is that we need to accept Jesus Christ. We're going to have a time of communion now, and, and I hope that you have your communion elements nearby as we do this each week. And just remember to be so thankful. I mean, you know, the cross is the moment where Jesus made all of this possible. The resurrection, where he proved that he was the Son of God, and, and that he has the power to do all the things that he says he will do and can do. And he is doing. And so I want us to pray together and commune together as uh, here at the, the close of this service. And stick around. Daniel has some important things to share with you uh, as we uh, come to a close in a few minutes. But let's pray right now. God, thank you so much for the cross, for seeing what Jesus went through, what he endured. And he did it all for us. And we want to accept Jesus as our Lord. I pray that every person watching will submit to, to his will and being baptized to have sins washed away and will commit to live the Jesus life, the life that's focused on others, that's focused on love, that's focused on service, that's focused on receiving from you all of your promises. What a, what a blessing it is to say that I'm a Christian, but it all goes back to the cross. And without Jesus, none of it would be possible. So I do pray, fathers, we partake of this body and blood of Christ, that we, we remember that. We remember not only what Jesus did, but what Jesus is doing right now in our life and what Jesus will do as we live our life and as, as we come to the end of the age. We just thank you, Father, for the faith that we have that spans every bit of it. And I pray, Father, that you'll bless each person as they partake of this communion um, thank you that we share this experience together. As we listen to a song, would you help our hearts to, to contemplate what you've done in our life? We love you and thank you in the name of Christ. Amen. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good. King of my heart, be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Oh, 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 you are good. Oh, you are good. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down.
you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. And what a wonderful message as we look into the life of Saul, who who becomes Paul, as uh, John mentioned today. And we hope you stick around over the next few weeks uh, for, for the rest of, of this sermon series. Throughout the, the video, our website has been up on the screen, facoc.org. Um, our website is full of uh, general information and opportunities uh, for you to be blessed or to bless others. So after the conclusion of this, I encourage you to go uh, check that out. There's a couple things you can do there and a couple things that I want to let you know of. First is our, our worship times. We meet Sunday morning in Monroe, 2101 Forsyth Avenue um, for our worship together. And then we have Bible classes following that. And then on Wednesday nights, at 6 p.m. and you can find out more about that on that website. There's also a place where you can go on there and you can give quickly, safely, and securely uh, to the work of the church um, here at Forsyth, wh whether that's local uh, missions or um, in international missions and ministries. You're welcome to uh, partner with us uh, in those. Uh, one more thing, um, there's a communications tab where you can put down, uh, you can put a question that sends a confidential email to the church office if you have a prayer request, which will be honored. We meet together and we pray um, every week. If you have a question about life, faith, God, anything that we can help with, uh, we'd love that opportunity. Or if you have some type of need that maybe we can uh, fill or help you fill, uh, we'd love to hear about that. So again, facoc.org, and I hope that you uh, were blessed by being a part of this uh, video. Uh, uh, video interaction today. I'd like to close us out with a prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for showing us that uh, people like uh, Saul, the, the chief of, of sinners, can not only be saved by you, but be used by you to further the work in your kingdom. And I pray that's what happens through um, our efforts here at Forsyth. I pray for everyone who's listening, um, that they hear your words and they act on them, whether it's uh, it's committing or, or submitting uh, to those. But I, I just pray that you work in, in the hearts of our community. Um, and Lord, I pray for uh, all the people that we know and love who are dealing with health issues and, and uh, physical uh, illnesses. I pray that you heal them, and um, I pray that we trust you uh, in those situations. And Lord, I pray that you bless the efforts of those who love you. And I pray that we are a shining light in this community. We love you, and most of all, we thank you for Jesus and the life and the hope that he gives each one of us. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder And leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations? With truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings.
This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.